I mean, I'll speak for about half an hour or so. It's just two parts, mainly. The first, giving some context around issues around colonialism, cultivation, and the soil, sort of really prioritizing the, the place of the soil within that uh, on a kind of more global scale and a much sort of longer historical scale. Um, and then I just want to throw out some propositions, responding really to the premise of the exhibition and also the workshop around issues around temporality. So Raphael's title, sort of figuring fallow time, I think is in incredibly rich and, and we can think about what that means um, in terms of, sort of repair and care and rep recuperation. Um, and then questions around care and problematizing that and also resilience. So there's those I'm hoping are things that we can sort of carry over into the, the next few days um, workshop. So I'll just, I've got some slides now, I can't quite remember. Oh yeah, so I'm going to begin by, I mean, Raphael already mentioned that we have collaborated together um, on a couple of occasions, one time in the context of the project that he did with Buba um, in Berlin at Archive Books. Um, we had a lovely symposium there, but also this project that was in London in 2016. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the duo, the sort of artist-architect duo called Cooking Sections, which is Alan Schwab and Daniel Fernandez Pascual. And they had this project where, called the Empire Remains Shop, which was a kind of speculative project where they took the the, the sort of historical fact that there was this project or there was this desire to have these shops in London that would sell the produce and sort of market the produce of empire, so the foodstuffs that were being brought from around the world and then sold to the, the English population. And they decided to kind of reenact that and think, well, what does it mean from the contemporary moment to sell the produce of empire back to empire, but with a twist? So they invited various people to come and do discussions, and we did a symposium, which was myself, two colleagues from Goldsmiths, Rose Gray and Nicole Wolf, um, and Raphael and Buba came and joined us, as well as the artist filmmaker Philippe César. And can we have the next slides? Oh, I've got some pictures. It's <laughs> just just to show that we were there. Um, it's not it's not sort of self-indulgent. Like, oh look, there's here uh, here's us. Um, I'm just putting these pictures up and some slides from, you can flick through, the, um, the publication that emerged out of that, because I think one thing that we could talk about over the next few days is the idea of collectivities and events like this, like what does it mean to hold symposiums, what does it mean to have exhibitions, to have workshops, and to think these issues through, especially issues around care, resilience, temporality. Um, and to think about making publics, so publishing as a mode of making public. So the idea of the being, you know, the publication is a residue of um, a workshop and sort of various collective moments of thinking through issues. Um, so that's something maybe we can talk about. But I'm going to just draw from the um, introduction that myself and Rose Gray and Nicole Wolf wrote to to this particular text. This is a really beautiful photo essay by Buba. Um, obviously a lot of this gets transposed in a much more uh, expansive way in the, the Sewing Samankidi Kura book that is outside. Um, you can just keep flicking through until you get to there's a third text cover and then we'll stop. So now I'll read. Um, so this is drawing from that introduction. So in an article entitled Making Time for Soil, techno-scientific futurity and the pace of care. Yeah, we'll stop there. The scholar Maria Puy de la Bella Casa addresses relations to soil care that are obscured by predominant uh, timescales of techno-scientific futurity and innovation. So rather than consider soil simply as a receptacle for the cultivation of crops, so a passive sort of substrate, in other words, a site of, pr of productivity or a financial return. De La Bella Casa asks us to engage with soil as a living interdependent community and with forms of soil ecology that figure alternative human soil relations and what she calls a care time. And this is something that I'll be returning to in part two. So even her attention to practices that have been made invisible or marginalized by dominant and successful, quote unquote, forms of techno-scientific innovation, De La Bella Casa takes resource from not only an ecological but also a feminist approach. Then our proposition in this collective uh, publication or chapter is that 
uh, much of what she's talking about actually, even though she's not articulating it as such, implicitly resonates with the post-colonial. So we're thinking about the, the uh, feminist and the post-colonial together, as well as a kind of post-humanist approach. And that it's only in combining these approaches that we can, as she puts it, catch glimpses of alternative livable relationalities. Relationalities that might hopefully contribute to other possible worlds in the making. So why the post-colonial? So shifting our gaze back historically and further afield across the colonized world, we note that the lasting legacies of the conjunction between colonialism cultivation, both cultural and agricultural, and practices of representation, above all in the hegemonic neo-colonial relations of contemporary neoliberal globalization. So central here is the soil, both in its literality and in its currency within the collective imaginary. So first of all, as a site of exploitation. And I'm assuming that, that Raphael and, and Bubo were talking about soil in the, the tour of the exhibition to some degree. Yeah? Oh, okay. Okay, all right. Well, we can talk more later. So colonialism, just to give an overview in general, has con con constituted and continues to constitute what we can call an offense against the earth. So here one need only think of agricultural ex exploitation and the imposition of monoculture agribusiness. And with this a violent rendering silent of ecological and situated or often subaltern knowledge or of neo-colonial extractive capitalism, i.e. today's cor corporate colonialism and practices of so-called development and sustainability that run counter to the care time that I began with. So here we recall uh, Franz Fanon's diagnosis in his 1961 book, Les Damnés de la Terre, or The Wretched of the Earth, of Europe as having been built on the nutrients and the raw materials of African soil. Um, <coughs> and I think this is something that we can think about uh, also in watching the, the film later on, um, the way in which sort of colonialism is, is basically robbing the resources of African soil obviously in the French context later. So not to mention the contemporary realities of settler colonialism built upon the legal doctrine of terra nullius, which is basically the idea of empty land or nobody's land, and the subsequent visible inscriptions of ownership upon the land, or in military scorched earth tactics or policies. In other words, the destruction of the so-called useful elements of an environment in order to weaken a so-called enemy. So as such, to use the words of the post-colonial literary scholar Pablo Mukherjee, colonialism and imperialisms, old and new, must be understood as a state of permanent war on the global environment, including, as is our interest, on the soil, as a planetary entity and as the infrastructure of life. So as such, in order to conceptualize alternative political, conceptual, economic, social, and ethical futures, and I think that's something that the, probably the workshop and the exhibition is asking us to think about, like looking at historical um, experiences, but then also what are the sort of resistant practices within that for moving forward into the future. So in order to conceptualize such futures, and in order to make such propositions speak to our present and future contexts on both a local and a global scale, across which the legacies of colonialism continue to be felt in varying intensities, it is necessary to think together both post-colonialism and the politics of the soil. In other words, to open disciplinary borders for a practice that we might refer to as post-colonial ecologies. So moving away from the Fugitive Remains project and looking further afield, one notes the currency of soil in cultural and political imaginaries. So notable here is the work of the Indian eco-feminist uh, Vandana Shiva. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Shiva's work, she's an environmental activist, a food sovereignty advocate, and an alter globalization scholar. Can we have the next slide? I've put them in the wrong order, I realize. Thanks. Um, 
So in her 2015 book, Soil Not Oil, she writes of the transition from oil to soil as a political transition. And I'm just showing these images of the cover because I also want to think about the sort of currency of metaphors such as soil, such as soil in the sort of political and social and cultural imaginary. So I'm going to quote her at length. She says, this transition from oil to soil. Yeah, oil to soil even though the book's called Soil, Not Oil. Uh, she says it's a transition from undemocratic political structures, which impose globalization and a fossil fuel infrastructure on society and force the large-scale uprooting of peasants and indigenous peoples, to a decentralized democracy in which local communities have a say in what happens to their land and their lives. So this is the soil, is the having a say. So in a sense, soil is a metaphor of decentralized and deep democracy. Consumer democracy is a pseudo-democracy associated with economic dictatorship. It desertifies the soil of real democracy. Authentic democracy, like plants, grows from the ground up. It is fertilized by people's participation." End quote. So, of course, there are further soil metaphors and allusions. Uh, one could sort of list countless um, examples. So, for instance, we can think of unearthing histories or excavating histories, the idea of rootedness in terms of situated knowledge, situated practice, or the idea of being earthbound. And then sort of associative ideas and practices such as nurturing, cultivation, inheritance, as well as, of course, more sinister uh, metaphors such as those of blood and soil in the context of Europe. So something that we're seeing a resurgence of in contemporary eco-fascism and also right-wing environmentalism. This is something that we see in the context of the UK and Brexit, but also many other European countries. But besides metaphor, and here we can go back to the previous slide, we also need to be attentive to the literality of soil. And I think this is what's so wonderful about the exhibition and the project and Buba's sort of talking about the very precise details of, of how things are cultivated and cared for and sort of how infrastructures are created. You know, that precision and that literality needs to be balanced with the metaphor. So this is something that was important for another collective project, so this was a special issue of the journal Third Text that many of you might be familiar with. It's a quite old, long-standing journal that deals with issues around post-colonial studies and contemporary art. Um, and this was a title, uh, an issue that was entitled The Wretched Earth, Botanical Conflicts and Artistic Interventions. This is actually a, an image by the artist Zina Sarawiwa, who's the daughter of Ken Sarawiwa, one of the Ogoni Nine who was uh, uh, executed in Nigeria, who was really fighting for the rights of the Ogoni peoples in the context of the exploitation of the land by Shell. Um, so, um, in the introduction to this issue, Gray and I uh, opened the issue with the following, and I'll just read a little bit. So we begin with the recognition that the earth is wretched. This is not a metaphor. It is literally our ground. So the earth is wretched because its soil, the thin layer of earth at the surface of the planet upon which we depend for life, is contaminated, eroded, drained, burnt, exploded, flooded, and, and impoverished on a worldwide scale. So in stating this, we evoke Franz Fanon's seminal book, The Wretched of the Earth, which called upon the wretched of the earth, the, the Les Damnés de la Terre, to rise up against imperialism in all its forms and to create a new world that would depart from the hypocrisies and violences of European humanism. As uh, Jennifer Wenzel and other scholars of post-colonial environmental humanities have pointed out, despite his profound anthropocentrism and utilitarianism with regard to the natural world, Fanon's work is crucial for recognizing that, as he states, the land is the most essential value. So here's quoting from Fanon. European opulence has been nourished with the <coughs> blood of slaves and it comes directly from the soil and from the subsoil of that underdeveloped world." End quote. And a little further on, we wrote the following. 
Our proposition is that in order to do full justice to Fanon's diagnosis of the wretched of the earth, we must understand more deeply the extent to which this is due to the fact that the earth itself is wretched and that part of this condition has been the destruction of our ecological relations with the earth. So the phrase the wretched earth signals our ongoing engagement with anti-colonial and anti-imperialist writers such as Fanon, but also the need to go beyond their reconfigured humanism and in order to think about the multiple human and non-human cohabitations that constitute the soil and more broadly are more than human commons. And I think that's something again that might be discussed over the next few days, this idea of the more than human as a co-production. So remaining on the level of the literal, according to Bilakasa, soil is the infrastructure of life itself. And like other forms of infrastructure, it's perhaps only becoming visible more broadly when it starts to break down. So it's something we take for granted until problems arise. So this is certainly the point we have reached across much of the earth as we transgress the planetary boundaries within which life is sustainable. So soil is the stuff of life and it's made up of our residues, so it tra transforms them into humus and our, con our connection to that fragile layer of the planet on which human life depends is acknowledged in the fact that our species name, human, is derived from humus. So Bella Casa argues that we need a shift in perspective that makes the soil visible in all its liveliness, peopled by all kinds of beings, so earthworms, fungi, nematodes and microbes that sustain its health. She points out that the making the invisible workers of the soil visible is not a neutral affair, and I'll be coming sort of more to issues around neoliberalism and capitalism and labor. Quote, words matter. Thinking of worms as managers reproduces the hierarchies of capitalist productionist culture. And here I think we can think of, maybe there'll be some discussion in the context of uh, Somankidikura of the termite mounds and sort of termites as kind of co-laborers uh, in the cultivation pro process. Um, so turning to the sort of second part um, of the, the talk around issues around care and resilience. So in turning to this, my title, this idea of refusing to be resilient thusly, is actually a kind of play on, on the work of Michel Fair, who's drawing from Michel Foucault, who's talking about non-governmental politics and this idea of refusing to be governed thusly. And I think in the context of environmental crisis and sort of broader discussions around resilience and care, we can think about that sort of being governed in light of this sort of imperative to be resilient. It's part and parcel of the same thing, I think. So, returning to this idea of refusing to be resilient thusly, we can read in Shiva's book, The Soil Not Oil Book, statements such as the following. So she says that increasing the biodiversity of farming systems can reduce vulnerability to drought or to increase resilience, or it can increase resilience. Or that, quote, biodiverse organic farming creates a debt-free, debt suicide-free, she's talking obviously of the Indian farmers' suicides, productive alternative to industrialized corporate agriculture. So Shiva's work, both in her writing and her campaigning, is laudable and immensely useful in many ways. Um, and also in terms of her, stru her stress on the harm of monocultures, which we can think both culturally and agriculturally. So we can think about sort of monoculture, mon monocultural farming practices in terms of epistemological practices and a sort of closing down of diversity. So much as her work is useful, I'd like here to offer a word of caution regarding the use of such terms, like from the quotations I just read out. So terms like resilience, productivity, um, so what I would like to propose is that a term such as resilience be thought, <laughs> uh, be thought in terms of its paradoxical usages, that it functions through the logic of the pharmacon, so the drug itself derived from a plant that hovers indeterminately between poison and cure. So this kind of double bind of, of a term such as resilience. So here the pharmacon is that which might be un instrumentalized 
often with the best of intentions, as a mode of safeguarding against or curing the threats of climate change, extinction, loss of biodiversity, food scarcity, and so on, but in fact often serves to worsen or to poison the situation and the quest for resilience. So this logic can be traced back to a longer history of neo-imperial developmentalism and humanitarianism, as well as practices of heritage, biodiversity, preservation and sustainability, both cultural and agricultural. So we can discuss many examples, there are many contemporary examples, I mean, I'm just sort of putting these sort of broader conceptual framework out, but there are many things we could talk through, but a good historical example would be uh, the so-called Green Revolution, and as well as genetically modified crops that are being sort of used nowadays as well. Um, so resilience here needs to be understood in the context of practices of greenwashing and also green banking, the idea of the sort of financialization of nature. We can think of, it, of practices like carbon offsetting. Um, so this kind of idea of, of uh, profiting, in a sense, from sustainability. Um, and this is also something that's related to practices of green grabbing and disaster capitalism. So sort of taking people, claiming bits of land that are gonna then be preserved, but actually dispossessing the inhabitants of that land. So furthermore, in the context of environmental justice, the point has been repeatedly made that whereas supranational binding agreements on quotas to tackle climate change, combined with adequate state policy are necessary, Neoliberal governmentality increasingly seeks to place responsibility on individuals. So for instance, as is commonly evoked, and it's kind of a joke in a sense, on our recycling practices or our use of plastic straws. So these individuals who become green consumers and are expected to themselves be resilient. So this, criti this critique of resilience must be coupled with a critique of neoliberal or productionist discourses around care. So a term that's increasingly in instrumentalized in many fields, including in the cultural and educational sectors and institutions. So here the work of Dilla Bella Casa is once again useful. So in her 2017 book, Matters of Care, Speculative Ethics in More Than Human Worlds, she outlines the entanglement of care with hegemonic regimes. So she says, quote, calls for caring are everywhere from the marketing of green products by which companies compete to show how much they care, to the purchase of recycled items by which consumers so show that we care, more profound and preoccupying than the, this moral marketing gloss is how neoliberal governance has made of caring for the self a pervasive order of individualized biopolitical morality. So these consideration, those considered as traditional carers, so for instance women, or as typical professional carers, so nurses and other marginalized unpaid or load paid workers, care workers, are constantly moralized for not caring enough. Michelle Murphy shows in her research on the women's health movement how projects driven by a notion of care can in fact serve colonizing projects and the list goes on. So it's just to give a sense of how the sort of double bind of such terms and how they themselves can be instrumentalized in, in hegemonic uh, projects or regimes. So returning to the soil and the article that I evoked at the outset, Bella Casa inscribes soil care within dominant neoliberal productionist and techno-scientific contexts. So this can be conceived notably in terms of temporality as is evoked by the title of the workshop, which I already mentioned, Figuring Fallow Time. So this idea of let, leaving something fallow, letting it rest, of leaving it aside for a while. So Bella Casa's approach is informed by feminist approaches that engage with care as a way to draw attention to the significance of practices, and I'm quoting from her, and experiences made invisible or marginalized by dominant, successful, quote unquote, forms of techno-scientific mobilization. 
I, so this is something that's very much related to post-colonial concerns as well about sort of retrieving minor histories, subaltern knowledges from underneath these sort of dominant paradigms or these dominant narratives and practices. So Bella Casa traces how certain soil ontologies and relations to soil care are obscured by the predominant timescape of techno-scientific intervention, which is driven by an inherently progressivist, productionist, and restless mode of futurity. Um, so what she's talking about is the, the need to sort of protect a different form of temporality. And she's talking about so human, non-human relations and the way in which they might sort of offer different ways of conceiving of temporalities. So this idea of the pace of soil renewal that she talks about entails engaging with soil as a living, independent community rather than simply a receptacle for crops. And she's talking about sort of humans and non-humans as co-producers within this community. So thinking again about worms, termites, um, in relation to the human. So with respect to fallow time, i.e. the ac active letting soil rest, that's sort of done in, in the name of repair uh, and renewal, um, care time, or what Bella Casa talks about as care time, is neither a sort of simply slowed down uh, temporality, or it's, and it's neither, nor is it simply outside the time scale of techno scientific futurity. So, focusing on making care time does, however, offer glimpses into a diversity of timescapes or timelines that, despite being made invisible or marginalized in the dominant timescape, can challenge traditional notions of techno scientific intervention. But yet again, we need to proceed with caution, for if there is to be a slowing down, which is something that's advocated, for instance, by the scholar Isabel Stengers, this doesn't necessarily question the direction of the dominant timeline. So what she's saying is it's not enough to simply continue with the sort of colonial or the Western <coughs> European idea of uh, futurity or progress as a sort of linear time scale. It's not enough to simply slow that down. We need to be thinking about alternative frameworks for temporality. So rather what she and other thinkers of more than human sociality advocate for is a decentering of anthropocentric temporality in technoscience. So as she explains, and this is just to give an example of what this might look like, otherwise it remains completely vague and abstract, like, okay, what, what other kind of temporalities might we conceive of? Sounds nice, but what do they look like? So one example sh um, that she gives is if we think of time from the perspective of earthworms, artificial fertilization of soils that's aimed at accelerating yield would actually be a slowing down of the development of worms and other essential soil communities. So th this acceleration is actually causing them to slow down. So meanwhile, interventions that adjust to the pace of soil communities' reproductive capacities foster the proliferation and thriving of their habitats. So what seems slow or backwards when living according to one timeline or one time scale might perhaps have a different sense from another. So this idea of switching perspectives outside of the anthropocentric perspective. So conceived of such, the time of soil, we can think about it as being plural, being more than one, and exposing multifarious speeds of growth that become e ecologically significant to each other. And so we can think about this idea of a kind of diversity of coexisting timescales or temporalities. Um, and just to conclude, to come back to what I already mentioned in terms of the sort of refusal to be resilient thusly as a kind of a rereading of the refusal to be governed thusly. So here I'd like to evoke Michel Fair's rereading of Michel Foucault and his work on the care of the self. Uh, or the cultivation of the self in the context of non-governmental politics. So Foucault's talking about neoliberal governmentality and then Michel Fair is taking this up in the context of NGOs and um, the politics of non-governmentalism. Non so this shared determination not to be governed thusly is a key dimension of Fair's account of non-governmental politics. 
And we can think about this in terms of the way in which, uh, you know, I already mentioned that on the one hand we need states and intrastate agreements in order to tackle climate change, but what tends to happen is that a lot of the responsibility in Given the existence of non-governmental organizations, a lot of the responsibility for the care work that the state should be carrying out actually gets displaced onto these non-governmental organizations. So they become, they end up becoming like a kind of proxy for the state or the welfare wa work that the state should be doing. So we can think about a kind of non-governmental politics that is actually trying to resist that and trying to answer back to the state and trying to hold the state accountable rather than normalizing the sort of state's letting go of its responsibilities. So, rephrased as refusing to be resilient thusly, this would have much to offer in the context of environmental activism as a means of protesting a mode of governing that is premised upon the assumption that individuals best fulfill their, their political and civic obligations when they seek to fulfill themselves as free individuals. And there'd be much more to talk about in terms of the kind of marketization of the self or this idea of self-appreciation that Michel Fair talks about and sort of the fulfillment of the self as this free, liberal, resilient subject. So what I'm saying basically is we need to expand this discourse in the context of environmental politics to think about the role of the human subject as a decentered subject, including sort of these different temporalities, these different ontologies. Um, so this is something I've been talking about in writing about recently in the context of uh, political and ethical witnessing practices, drawing on the work of uh, Michal Givoni, who's a scholar who's looking especially at sort of humanitarian practices of witnessing. So she's drawing from the work of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, um, and using Michel Fair's work to show how, in a sense, what these organizations are allowing for is a repoliticization of the individual, but as an individual who's part of a community that's actually offering care. So I think it would be very easy in the context of a critique of neoliberal policies to say, okay, neoliberalism is enforcing this sort of fulfillment of the individual or the responsibility of the individual, therefore we need to resist that. And yes, we do need to affirm collective or community practices, but there's no need to entirely do away with the responsibility of the individual. So I think this is what's useful in the sort of Michel uh, Foucault's work on the care of the self, also being a care for others. Um, so what we can think about is the sort of practice, this expanded practice of a kind of non-governmental resistance or protest um, as a kind of means of defying neoliberalism from within. Um, as I already mentioned, it's a means that doesn't simply denounce and lament the personalization of politics as the strategy through which neoliberalism causes people to lose sight of their collective interests. So rather, it's a, it's a simultaneous cultivation of the self and care for others. That, an act that as an active participation in political life allows for strategies of self-cultivation that are regarded as a way of relaunching the politicization of the personal. So a means for citizens to carve out for themselves new avenues for public action beyond those already prescribed in official politics. So I think we could, there are many examples. One example would be practices of citizen science. So I'm thinking of the work of uh, Jennifer Gabris at Goldsmiths. She's now working at Cambridge. But so practices that are taking the sort of techno scientific techno-scientific innovations that are being used by the state, but also applying them on a citizen level, as a non-state or a non-expert level, in order to hold the state accountable for, for economic viol um, violations or pollution, for instance. Um, so we can think about this, this sort of repoliticization of the personal in this context. Um, I think maybe I'll end there. I'm a little bit over time. Yeah? So I have a question. Yeah. Um, you just ended up talking about these 
uh, techno scientific um, this practice of, of using uh, technology on a civic level. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if you could be a bit more concrete in that sense. Yeah. I didn't quite understand. Is it kind of like databases collecting data? Is it surveillance? Yeah. And how is that being used? Is yeah. It just to people understanding the technology and then what's what's going on? No, I think, I mean, there are many examples. I just, I spoke about the one from Goldsmith's uh, Citizen Sense. So they're actually creating these, I mean, I, I don't understand how it works technically, but these little boxes that they're placing around, especially in the local context of New Cross, which are sensing pollution. So they're leaving them in neighborhoods or in public spaces and then collecting that data in order to produce reports. So in the context of the UK, we know that around Goldsmiths, it's one of the highest polluted areas in the UK. And we've, there's all this de data that's coming out around the effects, especially for children's health. Um, so it's just to collect that information. And then some of that information then does get cited in mainstream media reports. Sometimes it gets brought into policy. Um, but I was just using that as one example to say, because it's a good one, because the project, it's also, in, in other elements of the project, it's looking to the natural world as a kind of uh, sensor. So there's Gent Gabris does work on lichens as sensors, as kind of sensing environmental pollution. So going back to what I was saying about, you know, needing to think about human, non-human relations and both as kind of active producers, in a way, a project like that is actually opening space for the environment or the non-human to actually play a role in producing the information that, that is then given to the public or given to inform policy. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure other people can think of other examples. Resonance and what you mm -hmm. what you summed up. And okay, also good. This, uh, what we call the geoengineering to believe yeah. that you know we'll manage to to get the whole sea into drinkable water in the Israeli example, or yeah, yeah. You know, to clean the whole air and clean the whole uh, sea again after massive oil spills and this this constant going new belief in a. Um, so I think you mentioned that uh, not to space off, but. Uh, you mentioned that in the beginning, and I was quite uh, surprised and happy how you talked about the, you know, pink washing. Green oh, green washing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, it's, yeah. It's, it's massive in, uh, you know, not only in Norway, Berlin, or yeah, yeah. where you have, uh, you know, Google takes care of the poor parts of the world, or uh, you know, Puma, and it, so it's like a big, it's a big business that's in this. Um, uh, and I was wondering, like, when you when you name these uh, artistic interventions, if you also sometimes see like the edge of of something being, you know, captured to the side of the green. Yeah. Machine. Well, one example would be uh, the work I've done on Jumana Mana's film, and obviously that's a sort of resonant example because she studied in Norway and has an earlier film. <laughs> Oh really? Okay, yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> She's great. But uh, I mean, it, it's a good example for this context because she has the earlier film, The Goodness Regime, where she's looking at the kind of status of Norway's sort of role. I mean, I don't want to land in Norway and be like, okay, like, <laughs> but you know, she herself is examining that this kind of self-creation of this image as a kind of peacemaker, global peacemaker, right, or a sort of a really prominent actor in terms of global geopolitics, obviously with the Oslo Accords. Um, and then the, the recent film, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Wild Red Relatives is a sort of exploration of seed saving practices and the withdrawal of certain seeds, duplicates of seeds from the Svalbard seed vault after, as a consequence of the Syrian civil war. So the seed banks in Aleppo it still exists or exi existed then, but nobody could access it and nobody could look after the, the crops there, the seeds there. So the duplicates that were at Svalbard got withdrawn and they got recultivated. Uh, in similar arid conditions in Lebanon and Morocco and other places. And that, I think, is a really good example, that film. It's a very slow, meditative, um, following the movement of 
a few varieties of seeds from Norway back to these dry conditions, but also following the stories and the lives of the people whose hands these seeds pass through. And then what you very quickly begin to see is the way that this sort of global image of um, saving the world through a practice like, or a, an institution like Svalbard, it's the same we can say for all of these global biodiversity initiatives or sort of climate change um, initiatives that are supposedly responding to climate change, that a lot of the time so much work goes into creating this image of them saving the world, whereas actually you can trace a direct line from the way these institutions are functioning it comes from the same logic that underpinned the Green Revolution, and we know that the Green Revolution didn't work, it made things worse. So again, it's this kind of monocultural imposition, and if you're talking about sort of geoengineering, it's a very similar, it's this idea that we can step outside the planet, or the, the globe, and have this kind of God's eye view and have this one-size-fits-all solution. I mean, this is really sort of, I'm, I'm being extreme, but in a sense, that is the logic you can see. What a film like Manas shows is also she's she's not so quick to be she's not that uh, extreme in terms of like global practice is bad local practice is good she's showing the ambiguities between the two I mean I'm just saying that you know you, one can see that logic but once actually you start interviewing scientists you realize you know they're not all the bad guys of course right and they're not all following that simplistic practice um, so I think filmmaking practices or other artistic practices like that can show us they're useful for showing us those ambiguities and those little stories that that make you begin to understand these logics yeah i'm sure there are other examples but yeah i was um, kind of blatantly when you say like the green revolution just made yeah. things worse uh, it was be nice to kind of if you could go a bit into detail about yeah. that, what you yeah, yeah. about that is like yeah. corporations just took it over anyway and yeah. then turned it into something industrial or well this this y yeah I mean some of the seed banks actually were then because seed a global network of seed banks was set up in the context of the green revolution and that of course it's great for all different nation states to have their own collections of their seeds but at the same time a lot of that genetic material was being taken back to the US and being used and capitalized upon. So there's that, and then you can trace it. I mean, it's dubious to make really sweeping claims because one needs to look at the facts of like who's actually financing the Global Seed Vault or how, what the links are between Svalbard and the Crop Trust and Monsanto. And you know, there are all these rumors and actually it's quite hard to trace that directly, but certainly um, there are some connections, but no, what went wrong is more this idea that you can genetically modify crops which are more productive. So again, you've got that language of productivity um, or high yield varieties. I mean, they all, they're called high yield varieties. So this idea of the yield and surplus. Um, and these are exported around the world. So what happens is you have to change the environment to suit the crops rather than having wild varieties, and this is what the film shows so well, wild relatives which actually adapt to suit their environment. So what's happening is that local infrastructure, and again going back to the soil, is being ruined. So you're having to put in much more water to uh, irrigate the, the fields. You're having to use fertilizers, you're having to use pesticides which are ruining the soil, which are ruining the local ecology. So actually in the end, this imposition of this sort of throwing in of a high yield variety is just destroying the local ecology. And there have been many reports that have shown that actually you know, in the end it didn't help in terms of pro pro crop productivity and in many contexts it's, it actually did make it worse in terms of the sort of ruination of the land and the productivity.